Okay, I'm going to do a little interim one here on the creation story of the ancient Sumerians. And uh, we're not going to, well, we can talk about a few different aspects of it, whether it's Sumerio-Akkadian or the original Sumerians, or if it's a later Babylonian type thing, but it all encompasses the same idea, and then you also see it reflected in biblical stories, which of course all came from this same area. Their floodplain there was known as Eden, and it's where the gardens originally were. Um, many people don't make a kind of connection, but in the Bible, when it starts out, they're actually in an area uh, that's a garden. And so this is way past hunter-gatherers and things like that. And it's already in a, in a time of plenty, and a certain people apparently got banished out, and their story became a different one out of that. We're looking here as a famous wall etching that's a relief, and uh, many people don't recognize... A lot of things so let me just vamp on it for a minute uh, this here is your primordial creature of chaos if you will this is Tiamat and there's an ancient battle of Tiamat in Bahamut and uh, it's two primordial dragons that had gotten to a fight with each other and uh, created our known universe or our cosmos itself and that we are a chunk of that creature and imparted with more water from having hit that second creature and its explosion exploded up and made the belt of many stars which is our asteroid belt of the remnant of that and then the rest of the Milky Way is a splattering of that and it's their explanation of the comets and things like that and where all that water had come from and indeed that's pretty intelligent it seems for people of this elder time and uh, they tell you of a planet of the crossing, the Nibiru, that had caused a problem back in the elder days and then a giant flood. And I still think that that correlates to an ancient knowledge of how the comet had streaked across that uh, shattered in our atmosphere above the continental ice shelf and caused the Younger Dryas event. But that's a side note for this also. What we're looking at here, uh, many people don't recognize a lot of things, but this is really just a horse with lion arms type thing. It has a jaguar type head rather than a lion or a female lioness, but it's undead. It's just a skull, if you'll look at it. And it has bat ears. Yeah, instead of horns, people always say that's horns and stuff, but it really seems they're concave and they've got uh, insets into them. And it almost has the snout of a dog or a rippling, but then again, it's decayed and things really rather nasty. And then over here we have Ningirsu. And this is the god of grain who ended up becoming a god of war. Later there's a female apparition of a goddess of love that becomes a goddess of war. And that's Inanna. Uh, later seen as Inat uh, in Egypt and Anatolia area. In fact, Inat is where Anatolia comes from. Anatolia comes from. But the sign of grain and people have tried to put different names on these and indeed Marduk later usurps the same concept but that's a much later Acadia Sumerian Babylonian type thing running on the same area but uh, the original thought had come back from something like this and there are two strains of this and I'll kind of vamp on it as I go through the story that they have here it's a small article is all it is but it's a Luckily, not one of those that throws a bunch of sitch and stuff at you, but it does hint a point at it. You see this guy has wings on, and this is where your idea of uh, angels comes from. He's holding lightning bolts. And uh, this is the god of grain, but then again, the grains grow from the spring showers that come from giant clouds and gods with lightning that cause things and, you know, can electrocute, short out things. But then again, there's electricity that runs through our bodies constantly that we're firing off to make our nerves work. It's a different aspect, but notice the trident effect on it, a double-ended type trident effect. And then there's bands around his arms. Ironically, we can't see the inside of each one, but each one has a symbol on it, but they are turned away. He has this classic sundial wristwatch type situation back in the day of it. He has a darker beard, but a lighter back hair onto him, and it's believed that this is one of the ones that they said had blue eyes like the sky. Of course, he's a sky god. So he has blue eyes like the sky and blonde hair. And so he is the lighter stuff. And the sky's light, right? And the night is dark and all those type of things. 
So, um, and there are a lot of people that'll have a darker beard than that. And they looked at the, all, most of these were painted and it's all just etched away and kind of sandblasted over time and such. But uh, one other thing that's not shown or mentioned much or talked about in here is he does have a fine one-handed sword for the ancient time this is made here. And then here's a sickle or a scythe, right? And this is showing you he is the god of grain, but he has this. This is also the killer. This is Father Time and the sickle and scythe and Scythians and known for that and them being masters of grain and these type of instruments here that even look like the Egyptian swords that have the curve bent into them that have a recollection off of it, something of a stronger nature of something like this that goes back to Kronos. Again, a, a god symbolically, a god of grain, if you will, but also a god of time. And uh, due to the, what had happened that gave him his deity, and he, again, castrated Uranus with this type sickle. You have the same type of thing in the Greek and Roman where Uranus was castrated as the Titan and so on and these ancient gods, right? And so there's a lot of, you know, depictions to this. This doesn't necessarily have the horns that everybody's familiar with. It's more of a wisp that looks like uh, wind, if you will. And uh, well, there's a few more things I was going to talk about here, but uh, just on this picture alone. But let's go ahead and get, get into the story here, if we will. Um, the origins of human beings according to ancient Sumerian texts. Now, Sumer or the land of civilized kings is what that relates to, flourished in Mesopotamia, now in modern day Iraq, around 4500 BC. Sumerians created an advanced civilization with its own system of elaborate language and writing, architecture and arts, astronomy and mathematics. Their religious system was a complex one comprised of hundreds of gods, According to the ancient texts, each Sumerian city was guarded by its own god, and while humans and gods used to live together, the humans were servants of the gods now. And uh, we still have that idea today. This is a concept that these people had brought and uh, that really gets swallowed up by everybody in the whole area, all of these ancient, uh, what we call Proto-Indo-Europeans, and how in ancient times uh, we know now through linguistics that they're Languages are really quite similar. One that does stand out as being quite different, and it's kind of the reason I went into it as part of my studies, is Sumerian. is because, well, it's the little guy over here with a point sticking up. It's the little purple elephant in the room, if you will. And then, of course, this was whenever we were taught that it didn't go back that far. And... Uh, it, it really goes back about 5200 BC where it's founded at, but then again, it's not like they popped like popcorn. And so you have to look at where they come from. And recently we've been looking at Proto Indo Europeans back in the 6, 7, 8000 BC. Then there's a little lag in there, but then there's Gobekli Tepe that's right there before that too. And we see that coming into it. And uh, we've looked at a few things, even Kamyana Mahila that goes back to like 22,000 BC. And it mentions Sumerian gods and goddesses and things and uh, motifs and so and there's even mammoths in that too as a verification but once they found that out tried to call it a bull um, now the creation of earth is known as the Enuma Elish in Sumerian and Enuma Elish means when on high and it's generally whenever the Bible um, has a chapter it was originally the first few words of each chapter was the name of what it was and so also are generally named the tablets of the Sumerians where it'll start with something that seems to be a little bit poignant and that will be its name of its tablet and it just goes so it begins when in the height heaven was not named, and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name, and the primeval Apsu, or Abyss, who begat them, and Chaos, Tiamat, the mother of them both, their waters were mingled together. And this is echoed in Egyptians, but let me continue. And no field was formed, no marsh was seen, 
when of the gods none had been called into being and none bore a name and no destinies were ordained then were created the gods in the midst of heaven Lamu and the Hamu were called into being and Lamu and the Hamu have to do with a few of our stars they have to do with Venus and Mars and that they were called into being and they were the first ones that people had noticed in the sky and being able to follow and there was others that came after and each became named and so on and then there were they knew there were hidden ones and they followed it on from there but this idea of this primordial chaos that comes to order this is the Egyptian concept too and it comes out of that we just talked right here about them being in the easy four thousands whenever these cities are formed in Ur and so on and 3100 BC is about our general thought and belief on Egypt coming together from two into one and it comes from an indigenous people from here that had left to go in there and I'm showing that slowly but surely to quite a few of you and I, if I just told it to you and went straight you'd be like yeah right so I think it's a whole lot better for me to just inch into it here and just show you how they slowly overlap and keep pulling things in I mean uh, you can easily see there's stuff like uh, cuneiform writing, lapis lazuli eyes, both of them have blue-eyed statues, especially in the earliest of times, the concept of Horus and, and beings that are anthropomorphic, um, just, the, just the look of the, uh, the statuary here itself, it's another thing. When you look at this, you see that everybody's done in boss relief. And that's done just like the Egyptian, same art. Now, sure, it looks a little bit different in style, but hold on, does it really? Because everybody's drawn in side profile. Everybody's body is in a turned sideways state, but then the face is always turned in profile. Like when you're a kid, you draw a profile better than a heads-on. It just doesn't look as good. But the eye's still drawn looking at you this way, just like in the Egyptian's one. Now it's not so inlaid or marked out, but it's it's pretty much like that. It's the same same concept, same style. It's not a lot of winged creatures over on the other side. There's a reason for that too. But then again, Horus contains that idea within him. Let's um, it's what we call aspects, I guess you'd say. Sumerian mythology claims that in the beginning, human-like gods ruled over the earth. And when they came to earth, there was much work to be done, and these gods toiled the soil, digging to make it habitable, and it's mining and it's minerals. And in ancient, ancient times, people, shamanistic people that were really wanting to take advantage of things, found this incredible area that flooded out, and with making of a few channels to help inundate those areas, especially as the floods rose up a few foot each year, hopefully not big floods, but rose up a few feet each year, it would inundate these fields and help to make um, uh, wonderful feeding times, you know, and, and great harvests and stuff, and a lot of people could be sustained off of this, and, they, and all they had to do was merely just keep expanding it in any of these areas that had little flood out areas, and uh, it could sustain a large amount of people doing other projects other than having to farm, and all you had to have was a certain amount of people helping to do farming. And it's kind of what we have going on today, where unbelievably some of these farmers out here are sustaining tens of thousands of people off of each one of their crops and then e easily, you know. And so how many people, uh, how many farmers does it take per, uh, you know, a city of millions? And you know, even, uh, uh, you know, under 100 farmers can, can keep a million people going. It's amazing. And what we really need there is variety. And then we have to bring on some more farmers, you know, to get a lot of variety and different areas and especially southern areas and things but ah, let's get off of that concept here the idea is that the originators had come down these primordial gods had come down now either from north to south or from heaven and their idea is they end up now I can't give you this they came down on a spaceship what I can tell you is is that the, whenever they die they immortalize them as having gone home and it speaks of it in this way and then they tell you that they're deified in the sky and that they are the stars and the planets and that's them 
And so did they come from there? Well, that's what they insinuate. And then, of course, the Akkadian Sumerians and others after that say that. Did the original Sumerians say that? No. And see, I can't find that. In fact, you think if it was Sitchinized, it would go a whole lot more that way. And what I find is it doesn't. It's the later people that give an, indica an indication that that may have been. And, of course, Anunnaki is, the, if An is heaven, and then An Nun, right, Nun, and Nun is very famous. Shunun is the people of Kamyana Mohila. And there's Shumerians is what we're looking at here. And Mar is water. Mari, and then you have Aryans, right? So these Shumerians. The ancient primordial gods gave them these things. They gave them the plow. They did all these things. They don't give credit to it themselves, and that gives more credence to that idea. But these gods seem to have been humanistic things. They weren't something like what we're giving credit for God being something that is just you know, huge, or being able to do some kind of incredible powers and stuff, that they actually had to do something to make it happen, but they were well, well equipped, and apparently people weren't well, well equipped, it was like just blowing the people away, but they helped us out, and then they were gone, you know, and where did they go? They went on someplace else, right? So they got us started, and they went on someplace else, and then that's a lot of people's stories, and so there was this people going around helping everybody out, and we're trying to show you kind of how that split and went. But where did all this come from? And then there, there was these gods. Well, it tells you that after a while, the gods at some point muty need against their labor, that they had more important things, and that they had supposedly they were setting this up for a reason. What was this reason? Well, when the gods, like men, bore the work, and suffered the toll. The toil of the gods was great, and the work was heavy, the distress was much, and they acted like it was too much for them, and there was a revolt. And they had these Igigi people that were helping them, but were really not gods, but they were lesser gods, and they were only supposed to have gone, supposedly, for a certain amount of time. And apparently that time was up, and they were not through, or they weren't acting like they were through. In the tablets, there's an inclination at least twice to that exact endeavor. And so Anu, the god of gods, the father of the other gods, agreed that their labor was too great. His son Inki, or Ea, or Ya, approached to create man and to bear that labor. And so with the help of his half-sister Ninki, he did. A god was put to death. This is called Kingu, and it's where our name of king comes from, by the way. And his body and blood was mixed with clay. That sounds familiar, right? From that material, the first human being was created in likeness to the gods, or so in their own image. And so we have a fake little clay being being animated by these gods. And this is definitely a a Roman Greek type thing and you see where they form Perseus and set him back up and things like that like we're we're chess pieces and pawns and God's big overworld and we have that concept with God got him right now but of course there's always a council of gods in the Elohim that went with that too but and there isn't all these other pantheons too and the strange thing is it's extremely similar and based off of each other because of primordial origins of it all from different people and everybody had like a variation on a theme and if you really look at it with and you find the color of it it's all red whether you call it berry kool-aid or berry punch or this that and the other it's all yeah it's all that same adamic flavor of these proto-indo-europeans so it, it uh, tells you that Kingu, now in one of these stories, let me go into this before it says this, there's two stories variations here, and both of them seem to be elder before Marduk, but then Marduk just almost usurps the secondary one. One is of a dinner party type effect, and the guest comes in the room, and you are led to believe that you are the guest of, I guess, Adapa. You are Adapa coming into the group or in one of the other tablets, it's somebody else. But uh, 
was it uh, Nigashita? Anyhow, you come in, and as you do, you start to go around the procession, and it describes the gods. Well, it does so in exactly the order that they show up in our sky in order from outside to in in the heavens. And that, that could just be a fluke, you know, and, and maybe they knew the inside three, and so the other they got right out of a 50-50 chance making it three times, right? We, we can go with that. But in doing so, you know, they describe on as being light blue and green, and the, it's the colors, too, that go along with it, that Neptune is blue and so is on, and, uh, and uh, Neptune is inky. Uh, in, in the, so here we have with that trident and everything that goes along with it but in that procession there's somebody that's unwanted that comes into this dinner party and this is Tiamat and she comes in with her bodyguards and Kingu the bodyguard of Ki which is Earth which is our queen um, she gets spilled to drink upon her by her a fight a, a, an argument ensues a fight bodyguards go at each other. Kingu's head gets cut off and his head falls on the ground and forever faces Tiamat as it turns pale. And that's about it. And it says in one of the fragments, and they, they believe it goes along with it, uh, that after that the bodyguards got thrown out the windows. So, uh, you know, and, and anyhow, so this is you know, almost like the horror of Babylon and how you throw Jezebel out a window and stuff. Of course, this happened way before that. Anyhow, in the other story, there is just a primordial fighting of two gods and how it had slaughtered each other and made the waters and the sea going together. And so one is on earth and it's the sea god Yam and Leviathan and fresh water fighting with salt water, making brackish creatures that spawn forth life if you will that help to bring something in both of these versions there's a word called afar now afar in our language right now would be somewhere distant from the afar from something that's out there it's not here it's there it's the afar but in ancient proto-indo-european languages like sumerian Afar meant what was already there or something that was coexistent. Now in the Bible it looks like afar was taken to mean dust of the earth. And in Sumerian it's whenever you tear down a house and you're going to rebuild one and you have to find the cornerstone and work from there, you, then you use the afar. And so you make a brick out of sand and clay and, you know, and, and reedle it and put it all together and bake the thing and so on and now this sets up your deals but if you tear one down surely you don't just throw all that away you use as much as you can and so it's looked as like it was using something that was already there but an adaptation and in this we can find an idea that perhaps pro magnonish type man was formed by this union and that's what it's referring to or were left with the spaceman God imposed something and made a higher form of life that came up out of it rapidly. But let's let's continue here real quick. You have slaughtered a God together. With this personality I've removed your heavy work. I have imposed your toil on man. In the clay, God and man shall be bound to a unity brought together so that to the end of days the flesh and the soul which in a God have ripened that soul in a blood kinship to be bound so in other words we were somehow bound to these people and far away land people were bound to this people and whenever these ancient proto-indo-europeans went with this conceptive Thing to everybody this is a concept that came out of it that a blood kinship was bound somehow they had grafted themselves into it and this is a uh, ancient proto indo Europeans going and helping out other people quite often with getting with their women and so it doesn't show MTD DNA as much but you can find ancient haplogroups that reach farther than they were supposed to be 
and, and, and the slight variations in a theme that they're looking at too nowadays, but I don't want to get into genetics. Um, now, this first man was created in Eden, and that's a Sumerian word which means flat terrain. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Eden is mentioned as the Garden of the Gods and is located somewhere in Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Doesn't that sound familiar? Because in the Bible it tells you that Eden is the land, it's the garden, and it's all this, and it's special. There's another older tablet, too, that tells you about Dilmun and how that's a special little island that Inky goes to, and it's got a special garden on it, and there are no bad creatures there, and there's no fighting of animals because nobody on the island is actually a predator of each other. You know, maybe there's, you know, mice to the, to the bigger things, but those don't attack each other and so on and that there's a harmony going on and that's another look at it too that you could find that was echoed back in the idea of the biblical idea of this Edenistic type form. Now this shows you it says it's supposed to be the Sumerian tablet depicting Enki and the myth creation and here he has the two waters of the Tigris and Euphrates forming out of him but in reality this is the yearly cycle here where the two mountains that are just shown here as being these two pillars and here's the tree of life and at December 21st, the sun reaches its lowest point and starts cutting through here. And you can see he's got a knife. And as they do, it stays still for three days and then it starts rising again from its lowest point. Each one is only one degree, too. And in Sumerian, they're the one that are based on six and 60 and 10 base of that. And so they have the 360 degrees, and it was actually based on astronomy and how everything mathematically on the planet kind of works with things and how there's, you know, the fractal symmetry of things. And that's all based on ratios and maths that they had come up with, and they use a six math or 60, that's 360 degrees, and so the sun falls one degree per day down to its lowest point, stops December 21st, starts to rise on December 25th. This is the sun god, Shamash, or Utu. And he's rising again through there. Here is Inanna, and she's heralding him in, right? Here's the Anzu bird of wisdom coming down that's lighting off of Inky's hand. It's like he's a falconer, if you will. This is the two-faced god that is supposed to be his um, charioteer, and uh, he can see in both ways, and he cannot be true. Inky's the trickster, and He's got his sidekick, Batman and Robin, you can't trick him type of thing. There's a lot that goes with that idea, too, and who that may not even be the same guy. And uh, this over here is supposed to be Enlil that's here. And in a few other times, they show this same seal, and this ends up being the god of the city that they're in, and there's other symbology to the same one. And each one had their own symbology as Inky is shown as Capricorn, and here you see a goat that's right below him, and he seems to be stepping over it in some way, and then the fish, too, of Pisces and Aquarius. So he gets a little bit a little bit more of a, of a grabbing than he used to, um, or than he does now, if you will. Um, initially, human beings were unable to reproduce on their own, though it seems, but were later modified with the help of Inky and Ninky. Thus, Adapa was created as a fully functional and independent human being. This modification was done without the approval of Inki's brother, uh, Enlil, and a conflict between the gods began. Enlil became the adversary of man, and Satan means adversary, and so Enlil became the adversary of man. But, hold on. And the Sumerian tablet mentions that men served gods and went through much hardship and suffering. And each city had their own gods, and so it eventually caused a rift between cities in Sumeria, too, that were under either gods, and it started to become this issue where it really shouldn't have before. And it tried to become monotheistic towards each one in some way, where the other ones were kind of there and you would do appeasements, but they had their major god and then things got out of hand a little bit. But each city had their own major type god. Then also, though, in the pantheon there, Inki was given a lower position. And instead of being the lord of the world, which is what Inki means, he ended up being a water god and a god of the abyss or the, un or, or the dead. 
and supposedly this is whenever he had passed. But then Enlil took over. Whenever Enlil took over, he was a little bit different. And, uh, of course, he's the adversary of man, and he's the one that supposedly causes the flood that you see. In fact, he gets sped up and he tries to kill people. He tries to do it with a few different plagues and so on, and it doesn't seem to work, and it just causes them to whine even more, and he gets pissed and just tries to kill everyone. And he lets loose the gates of heaven, and it lets loose all the water, and it lets loose the water from the earth that fills up our wells, but it even came up from the ground because the areas that don't even usually get wet got wet, and that was their explanation of it. It's not what reality happened, though. It's just a whole floodplain, and I don't know if you've ever seen a real good rain flood out of some area, but, man, it'll just flood some area out real bad, and it flooded Sumeria out real bad, too. Anyhow, Adapa, with the help of Enki, ascended to Anu, where what he did was he ended up uh, having a... Uh, he was boating one day, and he got into a fight with the south wind, and he knocked it over and hurt its wing, and so then he went up to heaven, and whenever he did so, he had to make himself scruffly and uh, say that he was uh, lamenting uh, for Dumuzi and uh, Ningishida, who had passed away already, too, so they're already into heaven, and uh, then they would be real enamored by that and let him in, and they would try to hook him up because he shouldn't be in this state or whatever, you know, and uh, so be humble, and here's that idea that he had to humble himself real badly, and uh, so he went there and he failed to answer a question about the bread of water and the bread of life and he was told by Inky not to eat those, those uh, foods that they give him because it was secretly going to be foods of death that whenever he gave it to him would turn him like a vampire if you will it seems that way in, in the concept because it said that he would turn him into an immortal but yet he would die and then be a god and then he would be there in heavens with the dead people and he wouldn't come back to the land of the living and that Adapa had magic he knocked down the south wind and so we wouldn't want magic to leave earth and so he had to come back right so here's ancient magic and stuff like that right it's, it's kind of neat to have it thrown in there and looked at upon that way but um, opinions vary on the similarities between this creation story and the biblical story of Adam and Eve in Eden. And I think I've gone over that too with the creation story, showing you that even whenever uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, and he tried to seduce Enkidu, he sent a priestess there. She disrobed and she offered him food, uh, fruit from a tree and things. And over a period of a week, he slowly became humanized and no longer could run wild with the animals and so on and this was an idea of actually she took a man from it was a hunter gatherer that could live and run around in the wild and act like a being to something that was much more civilized and a city dweller that would now utilize farming and all these type of aspects to it too and then that same story goes into a death idea and so on but uh yep so uh sumerian chaos monster and 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 they listed here as the sun god Utu, but uh, quite a few times that's a, a little bit taken out of context. Utu was the middle god there. He was the sun god, and Shamash is his later name. And in fact, in the Bible, whenever it says uh, the sun god, uh, it's Chemosh or Shamash. And so it's the same type of guy. But yeah, I just thought I'd vamp over this and just give a little more, maybe not so, so, so in depth. But some of the things people miss out of certain stuff and correlations and exacting and he showed you right there, 5,200 B.C. So they had it going on well before what we look at as being in Egypt. Of course, there's this concept of Egypt was around a whole lot longer than that because the Sphinx is so early and everything. I think they used to, used to get a lot more rain in that area too. I think they used to. And whenever you pull sand and it runs down in that ditch thing like a giant drain, it really would etch into that. And it doesn't have to do it too many times if it's running torrents there. That Nile used to flood real bad, too, and have bad problems, too, just like the Sumerians and their giant floods did. But uh, it was controlled in different ways. Actually set forth crops at different times of the years, too, which really was amazing. Gave them something a little bit different. Uh, during one of them, spring is the other one's fall, pretty much, 
in their seasonal ability of the way that the rivers ran and so that allowed them to have perhaps dual seasons like we enjoy now to our fruits and our foods and things like that yeah like share and subscribe guys we're going to get into this a lot deeper i just thought do this as a secondary primer and show you some more connections before we do the Sum uh, the uh, sumerian egyptian connection one that involves boats and shimsu hor peace